evening, my name is Mike Haney and welcome to another edition of 60 Minutes in Black America. Today we're celebrating Black History Month with the irrepressible Dr. Joanne Martin of the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Hey, good evening again. My name is Mike Haney and welcome to another edition of 60 Minutes in Black America. And I promise you today will not be boring as Dr. Joanne Martin will talk about black history. And what is black history? Black history could be in your families. Black history could be in your neighborhoods. It's not just the traditional people and events that we see around the country and the world. And we'll try to expose you to some of that today. But first, let's update to some of the things that we've talked about the past week. We had Teddy, the tax man, preload. And I got to tell you, I thank each of you. We had hundreds of viewers. We're not the type of podcast that's going to get several thousand every week. But the seven to eight hundred viewers that we had last week that thoroughly enjoyed Teddy, the tax man. I hope that you took some of the advice that he gave you. And the biggest takeaway that I got, that I hope you got, is that, hey, let's take the return that we usually get divided by 12 and at least put that money in the bank. He went on to talk about the fact that we as a people do not save well. We as a country do not save well. But if there's anything that we can do to save a bit more than what we saved prior to the show last week. I want to hear from you guys. I want you guys to tell me, because I'm sure Teddy will appreciate that, because he said he's gotten blue in the face from telling people emphatically to save more, to save more money. And he also said last week that one of the best ways to create generational wealth was what way? through life insurance policies. So hopefully you've gotten a chance to give Teddy a call. Teddy the tax man prelo, give him a call so that he can guide you so we can start to create generational wealth and do better as we begin to file our tax returns. A couple of updates uh, from the show last week. We talked about uh, Tyree Nichols. He was buried on Wednesday, uh, February 1st. Uh, the Vice President of the United States, Vice President Harris, attended his funeral, as well as many other dignitaries around the country at this atrocious event of Tyree Nichols, if you don't recall, who was murdered at the hands of what we find out now may have been up to seven Memphis police officers because there were the initial five and two more since last week's broadcast have been suspended in conjunction to his death as well as three emergency medical technicians who were terminated from their job as a regard as as a as as because of what they did not do during the course of them not rendering aid to this fallen soldier so Tyree Nichols rest in peace may his family find some justice may we as a people find justice and the justice that they find and that we end these, atro these atrocities in our community with us and the police. Finally, we talked about the Super Bowl. Last week, we were in the midst of Philadelphia winding down its victory uh, against whoever they played. They won, and they're going to the Super Bowl. And then Patrick Mahomes from Kansas City, they beat uh, whoever they beat. Was the Dallas Cowboys? I don't know who it was, but we've got history of the making again on the celebration of Black History Month. We've got history of the making for the first time in NFL history. We have two African Americans starting at quarterback. We've got Jalen Hurst from Philadelphia and Patrick 
Mahomes from Kansas City. So we as a people continue to make history in this country and in this world. And at that point, who cares who wins? All we do, usually I do, is watch the Super Bowl commercials and the halftime entertainers. And I think we've got Rihanna. And they're also going to be singing the edition of the Black National Anthem. Now, you all tell me what the Black National Anthem is. Put it in the chat if you know. What is the Black National Anthem? They're going to be singing at the Super Bowl next week down in, I believe it's Tempe, Arizona. The Tempe or Phoenix, the Super Bowl be held last next week. As we mentioned, today we're talking about Black history with Dr. Martin. And then later on, we've got Jamie Miner, who is our crypto expert, talking about investment in crypto market, et cetera, because we said it's a huge opportunity for us as a people. But as we talk about Black history, what is history? What is Black history? And is it always the events of the civil rights movement? Is it always a matter that we think that uh, Frederick Douglass invented or uh, uh, George Washington Carver invented peanut butter and some of those things that we hear all the time about black history or is history a matter of what is generated even in our own family i think about my family i think about my sister i just got off a call with my nephew having visited south africa and greece and the history that he's generated inside our family so when we talk about black history and we talk about our desire to celebrate our history as a people Let's look a little closer in. Let's explore some of the lesser known historical facts that we as a people should be aware of, particularly as it relates to our own family and the history of that. While it's not unimportant to celebrate the bigger picture of it, such as Supreme uh, Justice uh, Brown, such as Vice President Harris, such as Governor Wes Moore, and we can go on and on, and such as Jalen Hurst and Patrick Mahomes. But what about the things that happen in your family? What about the things that happen in your neighborhood? What about some of the others that have been historical to us that perhaps we are unaware of? And then we go to Florida, the state of Florida, where Dr. Martin is from, as well as three of the interns that we have on this production team, which hopefully we'll get a chance to bring them in later. And we deal with what's happening in Florida with Ron DeSantis and the woke movement and his desire to dictate what black history looks like for our people in the state instead of what it is that we feel are historical points to us. And so it came about as a result of him saying that the AP courses, and let me read off some of the courses that were part of an AP process that uh, uh, Ron DeSantis protested. And there were curriculums or units such as the Black Feminist Movement and womanis, womanis, Womanism, Intersectionally and Activism, Black feminist liter literary thought, Black queer studies, which really sent him off the deep end. When he heard that, Black queer studies. Now, this is an intelligent person who perhaps should go to the dictionary to really understand what that means and how it's defined, but that all of a sudden, because he has a word queer, that he feels is inappropriate to be taught to his people relative to our history, however we interpret it, he wipes everything off the table to a point that certain aspects of CRT or critical race theory and certain aspects of black history as we see it as a people, you know, you can get a $10,000 fine in Florida for teaching it and how many teachers have been eradicated from the Florida education system as a result of it. So we'll talk a little bit about that with Dr. Martin and get her sense as a Floridian, her thoughts about Ron DeSantis. But let's play this quick 30 second tape for the viewers to really get a sense of what people think about Ron. 
By rejecting the African American History Pilot Program, Ron DeSantis has clearly demonstrated that he wants to dictate who story does and doesn't belong. He wants to control what our kids can learn based on politics and not sound policy. He wow. Based on politics and not sound policy. So I want to ask you all a question. I want to ask you a question. Let me find the question first that I'd like to ask you about race, right? And I want you guys to think about this and if it's relevant to what it is that's important to us. And here, let me let me just put it up here in the chat. And it's a matter of whether politics is racial or politics is opinionated. What do we think about politics, racial politics and African-American studies relative to politics or the African-American historical experience relative to who we really are and what should it be? Should it be the Ron DeSantis aspect of black history or should be the black history as we say and we define because it is our culture. So let's bring Dr. Martin into the stream and let Dr. Martin tell us who she is. And I have always thought that Dr. Martin is a, his, it, it, Dr. Martin, how you doing first of all? Fine, thank you, how are you? It is so good to see you. Last year, about this same time you did this show, and it was one of the top three most popular shows of ours uh, to that day, you know? So we welcome you back to educate us as a people. I say that you are one of the more classic historians and you should go down that way as a black history maker because you document events that have happened in our culture and our world as it relates to black people through wax figures. So tell us a little bit about yourself where you're from, although I've given them the secret you're from Florida, and why you started the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum and that really great guy that you started with. Well, um, I am uh, originally from Florida, and, and that's where I, uh, what I call home. Um, I have family there, and um, I take the exhibit uh, to Florida um, in particular and to Yulee. Um, because that's where my roots are, um, and so much of who I am is um, started in Yuli and, and, and remains connected to Yuli and to the state of Florida. Um, I am also uh, from Baltimore um, because of the, the connection um, that we have. Um, we started the Wax Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, um, the first um, Black History Wax Museum in the, the nation. Um, so those are my, my roots, but I am also from Black America. And, um, and that says that um, the traveling exhibit that, that we do, I want to be able to uh, reach out to the corners of, of Black America, but also um, what Ron DeSantis does not understand is that white America needs this history. It is their history as well. And um, I look at the leaders of um, the future leaders of this country. I had a group of, um, of young people who came from, um, I think, Baltimore County. Um, the majority of the, the students were white. Um, and there were two young uh, white males, um, students. And I um, was pressed into service to do a tour. Um, and it was clear that they were they were having none of what um, I was talking about. And one of them asked um, right mid-sentence um, as I was uh, introducing and, and talking about the history and the museum, he asked me, why do we have to be here and why do we have to uh, uh, listen to this? And the students of uh, his classmates, um, di uh, different reactions. Um, some of them um, angry that he would come that come off that way. Some of them happy that he would come off that way. The teacher embarrassed. And so I stopped and um, I thanked him for his question. I said, when I look around, um, I see um, 
some white students. I see some um, African uh, American students. I see some Latino students. I see some Asian. Um, um, uh, some I have to classify as other. But whoever you are, and whatever your um, background and ethnicity, ethnicity or race, you're the ones who are going to um, uh, be responsible for running this country. You are wow. going to be the um, the ministers or the doctors, or the politicians, the leaders. And if you have a chance of being a good politician or doctor or restaurant worker, a part of that will come from having an appreciation for all of the narratives that make up who we are as the United States of America. Wow, Dr. Martin, let me ask you a question, theoretical to you. Is there a difference between being politically black and being racially black? And what does that mean to you when you look at the political landscape of not only white politicians like a Ron DeSantis that wants to define what African-American studies look like and are taught to the white kids that presented that white particular young man that presented you that question, but to black politicians as well, because th there's a difference to some in being black politically and black racially. Um, I, I think that in this world, we have to be both. And I don't know how to separate out um, the two. I look at a Tim Scott, uh, for example. Um, and, um, and Tim Scott so is the as the senator from South Carolina, just so that we educate our viewers. He's a Republican senator from South Carolina, one of only two senators, I believe. We've got Raphael Warnock, the Democrat from Georgia, and Tim Scott from South Carolina, the Republican. So go ahead, Dr. Martin. Right. Um, Tim Scott would want us to believe that um, he's uh, political and that race doesn't matter um, uh, in, in terms of getting legislation done. Um, so the danger for me is that, uh, because of his, uh, view of po political view as being the dominant, uh, aspect of what he does, then he fought, he has fought, re um, police reform legislation. Um, so much of what these people who want to, um, to be race neutral as they become political, um, means that there is a rejection of a reality that um, they want to believe they, that they pull themselves up by their boot, bootstraps, nobody um, helped them. Um, that's a Clarence um, Thomas, for example, and uh, rejecting the, 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 the ways in which we've had to fight um, and that the, the, the ways in which the struggle has allowed them to do what they do. And, and so when they see themselves as simply political, for me, they insult our ancestors. So for you me, opened they... up a box, you opened up a box before I let you go on. You mentioned Clarence Thomas, right? Oh, you yeah. mentioned Clarence Thomas, right? Is Clarence Thomas part of the black history perspective and will he ever have a wax figure in your museum? No, he. Uh, in fact, um, someone asked me that when he um, uh, when he first took office. So no, I'm I'm sorry when he uh, when we opened the museum. Um, Clarence Thomas has no sense of the debt that he owes the ancestors. He doesn't feel um, a debt, and so for me, no one who. Um, has that point of view. Um, and my husband Elmer used to say ancestor worship is a good thing because so much of what you and I can do and what the what um, the interns are able to do comes off of the backs of people who were willing to put their lives on the line, who were willing to fight for something bigger than, um, than themselves. And so the museum honors those people. And Clarence Thomas does not want to be, cannot be, doesn't choose to be one of those people. There is no place for him. So let me ask you another question, Dr. Martin, because you're the gatekeeper 
of the National Great Wax Museum. And that's you and Dr. Uh, Elmer Martin together um, uh, prior to his death. And, uh, you know, I hope that we touch on that for a minute because he was significant. You guys were a significant partnership. Because you are the gatekeeper of the National Great Blacks and Wax, you've made a decision that Clarence Thomas cannot enter this. But when you look at the fact that he's racially black, Politically, we don't agree with his blackness. He's not entitled to be part um, of the black it, history. It, for me, it doesn't. Um, I, I don't. Um, there are aspects of um, the philosophy of Booker T. Washington that I, I don't agree with. But um, Booker T. Washington made his mark on history in terms of his accomplishments, his deeds. Um, Booker T. Washington fought for um, the uplift of his people. And for me, it's about uh, being willing to fight for uplift. It, it is not an individual achievement. And that's not, and, and that's what's important, that we are looking at people who um, understood um, the African principle I am because we are. Clarence, Clarence Thomas does not understand that. Um, he does not fight for uplift. He does not see his being on the Supreme Court, which I, I find ridiculous, but he does not see his being on the Supreme Court as having anything to do with anyone except Clarence Thomas. And he has set, made statements like that. And that's not who gets, for me, gets honored in our history. Um, and and, the, and it, it's, again, not having, it, for me, not, having uh, to have um, uh, just, I believe everything you say and you, and, and you have to um, see things my way. That is not what it's about, but it is about uplift. It is about lifting as we climb. It is about saying that I look to um, those who came before me, whose foot in whose footsteps I walk and I try to be an example of that. Wow, that's powerful. You know, Dr. Martin, and here we go with you, the co-founder of the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. And I, as I said earlier, think that you are a history maker because of what you document for our people. You know what I'm saying? And is your wax figure in the museum yet? And when does that come about? I. I don't know. I don't know. I hate looking at pictures of my of myself. Um, so I, you know, I, um, it it will come about. People have um, have asked, and I and um, the legacy of um, doctors Elmer and Joanne Martin is important um, to me um, only in the sense that I want to leave uh, a message that we can make a difference that we can be good to um, um, stewards of our history, of our legacy, of our planet, of our world, um, all of that. And, and so if my wax figure helps um, to say that and, and the wax figure of Dr. Elmer Martin, then for that reason, um, then I, I accept that there should be a wax figure of us. Wow, that's powerful, Dr. Martin. And I encourage you get visitors to this wax museum. I want to tell a quick story first that shows a bit of your wax figures. You know, you work with Southwest Airlines. We all know about Southwest Airlines. To me, they're one of the best airlines in this country. And they had a blip over the course of the past uh, holiday season. But, you know, I just live by them. I was at the airport last year. I was at the airport last year and, 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 and producers, make sure we go back to some of these questions and comments for Dr. Martin to uh, answer at some point during the uh, broadcast. But I was at the airport, Dr. Martin, and I kid you not, I'm in line waiting to go to the counter and I'm saying to myself, why isn't the line moving? Why are these people in front of me not go anywhere? And you see where they are near the stanchions, right? And then I'm like, okay, something's not right here. So I move up and, and I'm serious. This is absolute. I was so stunned 
that they were your wax figures from your museum that Southwest displays in the airport and the realness of them, the realness of them, I had to take a picture, man. I was stunned. So kudos to you, Dr. Martin, for continuing to document our history, which is why I think it's important that historians are important to this story, you know, and your ability to capture this, to fund this, to ensure that our children have the ability to come and see from wherever we felt it begun to where it is today, you know, I, I just, I just am so much appreciative of that. And if you guys have never been to the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, she gets tours, Dr. Martin's from all over the country and the world, correct? Can you tell us a little bit about that aspect of the business? Um, yes, we, uh, our, most of our visitors come uh, from the mid-Atlantic uh, region and, and most of them are from um, outside Baltimore and outside the state. Um, and that is made for our survival. Uh, for one thing, uh, you grow up in a, in a place and you think you can always uh, get around to seeing uh, the history uh, at what you're always looking for outside of, uh, of uh, your state and your town and so forth. Um, and so creating that uh, national audience that's why we were able to get through the uh, an act of Congress, the, the designation National Great um, Blacks and Wax Museum. And we tell a history that is not um, um, many of the of the museums that, you know, they're state specific or they're subject specific like civil rights and so forth. But our history is very comprehensive. Uh, and so that's another thing that attracts that national audience. And I want to reach as many people, especially as many children, wherever they, they may be. Um, and uh, because they're the ones who, if we have any hope of uh, being able to have a world that is just and better, then uh, we have to uh, try to make sure that we are trying to make them good protectors of our history and our story in our world. Well, there's no doubt you, des you describe yourself as an educator, and I would love your opinion of the governor of Florida's decision to compartmentalize or categorize the type of history of Black people that are taught in our schools. And as a result of that, eight other states begun to do the same thing, to regulate Black history as far as what it is that is taught. And something called the woke movement I'll define it a bit later, woke movement, you know, because they tried to, you know, they try to relate that terminology to old black slang by saying the woke, you know, movement, but that's not the case. It's a matter of a governor like Ron DeSantis saying that he's not going to subject his children and workers to certain atrocities like critical race theory so that they um, feel guilty. What do you right. think about that? What do you feel about that? And do you feel as though there's any aspect of what he's saying that's correct? Well, um, the uh, the daughters of the Confederacy, way back in, um, uh, we're talking uh, pre- and post-Civil uh, War, we're talking Jim Crow, the daughters of the Confederacy said that children, meaning white children, were living monuments and that would um, protect and defend states' rights and white supremacy. Um, that's one, at, uh, and that's what Ron uh, DeSantis understands. Ron DeSantis understands that with Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the when um, people like Charles Hamilton Houston and Walter uh, White were looking at how do you fight segregation in America, that they saw the public schools as the mechanism for fighting segregation. And the idea for the Daughters of the uh, Confederacy and for those um, who fought for um, to end segregation was that you start with young minds. You start with public education. Um, the um, idea was that you had a long time to create a just world, and therefore that's why you start young. 
um, the for the daughters of the um, uh, 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 Confederacy that you had a long time starting with young minds to create um, and, and cement and reinforce the white supremacy that this world was supposed to be in their minds. So Ron DeSantis understands. Ron DeSantis understands that he is looking to create a world that is not just. He is looking to create a world in which white supremacy rules and reigns. And he knows that you start young and eventually, and he's looking at um, diversity, uh, equity, uh, inclusion. You can't even say that those kind of words without um, being punished in some way, including losing your jobs. So he looks at this world and what it's become and a world in which we're trying to um, be just and diverse and uh, have equity and inclusion and he is looking to go back to what he and the daughters of confederacy understands as uh, a world where you defend white supremacy and states rights hey That's question for you before i question for you before i get to another question who's more okay. dangerous to this country ron DeSantis or donald trump I, I think that they have um, uh, a, 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 an equal danger. Um, Ron DeSantis, because he has more smarts um, than um, Trump, but he's just as corrupt and just as mean spirited. Donald Trump, because he has been able to use um, a platform to stay in the public eye, to uh, avoid uh, uh, any number of uh, legal entanglements. But for both of them, that they have been able to tap into an, a, an energy um, in this country that um, most people didn't know was there. Um, even though we deal with the reality of this country being racist. Um, and, and, and we deal with discrimination and inequity and um, inequality and all of those things. But Donald Trump opened up a whole can of worms that, that uh, people thought had been closed. They, wow, there's, it somebody, does there's, somebody, there's somebody that is thanking you. Somebody else is from Yulee, Florida as well is shouting you out. <laughs> and that's maybe my cousin Fanny, but um, we're named. Uh, she's named for my, our grandmother, and I, I, um, I know she's on the line, but it could be um, anyone. Um, and and you know, so we found ourselves um, with a, a, a hatred that people that people kept under the rock. Donald Trump um, took the uh, removed the rock, and there it was. But it's always been there. Um, but I I try to. Um, take heart with the fact that there are people fighting uh, this of, um, of all different uh, backgrounds and ilks who um, they made him a one term president. Um, Ron DeSantis, um, we have, he hasn't stepped out on the, the internet on the national stage yet. And I don't know what that's going to mean, but I know that there are people who um, tap into um, the the right wing conservative um, philosophy that he holds to um, the hatred of other people that he has the racism that he embraces and that that's very much um, either you have um, a conservative right wing Republican Party that um, sees opportunity by um, coming along with him or with Donald Trump, um, who want um, to be able to keep certain people in their place and may and and um, who believe in white supremacy. So, Doctor Martin, to deal with uh, Doctor Martin, another question for you, right? So, you talk. You're an educator. Talk to education and and viewers. I promise you, we're going to get to some historic people that we're both familiar with, Dr. Martin and I, and educate you as to maybe some of the lesser known in, uh, historical people. But Dr. Martin, question for you, question for our viewers to consider, was desegregation 
not necessarily a good thing educationally for black people. When you look at what we were able to accomplish educationally, when we had our own education systems before Brown versus Topeka versus what you see now. Did we thrive better educationally when we had segregated environments, raising our own teachers, going to schools in our own community versus all of a sudden wanting to be desegregated into areas that didn't necessarily want us? What do you think? Well, I'm a product of the um, the Nassau County um, schools. And with the exception of uh, one, um, one school, Case Western Reserve um, University in Cleveland, all of my um, uh, education has been um, black schools from uh, Bryan Academy where, uh, to Howard University where I got- So is that a yes or a no, Dr. Mark? What do you think? What is that? I, 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 so we I, don't want you to be a political I, I, black. We want you to be a, a racial black. I want you to answer that question, Dr. Mark. What do you think? I think I, I know what you're gonna say. Well, um, when I look at, um, the idea that uh, we did decided that um, white ice water was was better and colder than ours. When I look at the ways in which our businesses um, disappeared, uh, and and some of them never um, coming back, um, and uh, the ways in which well my educate uh, my schools um, were wiped out. Bryan Academy, Peck High, um, wiped out. Um, so my history um, just vanished uh, my educational um, history. But I also know that um, I am stronger because I had teachers who were supportive. I know that I am in the battle to see to it that our history um, remains within an in a, uh, uh, desegregated uh, uh, America, not integrated. But um, And so whether or not, it, I would have to speculate, I know we lost something. Um, right. And, and uh, when we lost our institutions. Well, you know, but, Dr. Martin, I hear you loud and clear. I'm going to take that as a yes. It's amazing how quickly time goes. And I know we want to educate some people because I'm one of the ones that, like you, although I'm not going to explain it, you know, where we are, you know, we crossed lines and we were educating our own and our communities very successfully. And we're going to talk about some of those that we educated tonight. So Claudette Colvin, how many viewers out there, you're watching 60 Minutes of Black America with Dr. Joanne Martin, and we're talking about Black history, not just from a historical perspective, but as we make it right up to today, some of the historical stuff that's happening right up to today. But how many of you have heard of Claudette Colvin? Anybody that's out there? that have heard of her, just put your answer in the chat and say yes. How many of you have heard of Rosa Parks? I bet you we get a bunch of answers, Dr. Martin, to Rosa Parks, but not many to Claudette Colvin. Do you want to tell the viewers the importance historically of Claudette Colvin, Dr. Martin? Um, right. Well, she was uh, Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks. Um, no, she um, was the original. Let's give her her due. She's the first one as a black woman that said no at 15 years old, two or three months before Rosa Parks. Right. It, exactly. And and um, and and what I mean is that, uh, as you said, people know Rosa Parks, um, but she at 15, when you think about that, to um, take that kind of stand. And uh, Rosa Parks became the symbol because a uh, part of it was that um, the NAACP and, and, and the um, civil rights uh, leaders were looking for someone who could fit the image. And so Rosa let me Parks give you, Dr. Martin, let me stop you right there. And let's talk about the image. Okay, at age 15 on March 2nd, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama, Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat to a white woman. Claudette did not see received the same attention as Parks for a number of reasons, not speculation, but back then in that day, she did not have the good hair. She was not fair skin. She was a teenager. She was pregnant. The leaders in the civil rights movement tried to keep up appearances and make the most appealing protesters the most seen. Okay. So that's the reason why many speculate because she was darker than Rosa Parks and she was 15 and pregnant. 
Would that? Would you agree with that? And does she have a place in history? Well, she has a place in history. Would you agree with that? Right, and that's why I'm saying she didn't. She didn't fit the image, whatever the image was was supposed to be. She didn't fit it, and they wanted someone um, that they could uh, put out in public, and and um, and she just simply was um, not seen as that person. Um, but she deserves her place. She earned her place in history. And, earned her um, place. Yeah. In history. All right. She earned her place in history. Who, yes. Who, who's this gentleman, uh, uh, Dr. Martin? Who's this gentleman? This distinguished gentleman. And this is a him in wax, right? Right. That's our wax figure of um, Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, who understood that being literate meant being free and therefore fought to learn um, to read and write, which was a dangerous um, thing. Um, Frederick Douglass, who said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And um, in creating his image, that's what I want. I wanted those fierce eyes that scream, ag uh, um, agitate, agitate. I wanted the big hair um, and, and the strength of, um, of, of, of Frederick Douglass, um, who was um, a, a, a innovator, uh, and a powerful voice uh, for freedom and justice. Wow. And Diane Clato, unbelievable. The first black woman and African American weather person on the airs, okay? She was the first black weather woman or weather person in this country and she said, Dr. Martin, she felt the weight of the world on her shoulders. Um, definitely a pioneer in a number of, she, um, she was a model at a time when, um, when those kinds of opportunities were um, closed to, um, to Black women. Um, it, uh, she had so many uh, careers, um, but um, finally making her way to, um, to uh, make it on air and become um, a weather person. Those are the kind of opportunities that were closed to, um, to Black uh, women um, in particular, um, and, and, and that she overcame all of um, those uh, and, and to pioneer, um, have a, 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 be a media pioneer. And let's make sure that our viewers understand that she wasn't the first Black woman weather person. She was the first Black weather person person in this country who was subsequently fired as a result of discrimination. And, and, and that's um, some, uh, one of the things that um, Black women face, Black people face, but Black women, um, because again, the image and this whole idea that, um, that Black women are, uh, they, they try to take over and, um, you know, that, that we, um, are uh, just too powerful for our own good. And, and wow. um, so the ways in which we have to fight um, all of uh, that kind of uh, stigma. You want to talk about Kathy uh, Williams a bit? First woman uh, enlisted in the United um, States Army. Yeah, such an interesting uh, person um, to me. Um, uh, that she served in the um, the Civil War as a uh, as a, a black um, male soldier, um, as uh, William Cathy. Her name was Cathy um, C A T H A Y, I think. Cathy Williams, um, but she joined um, the army as a, a male soldier, and um, named William Cathy, and served. Um, and uh, you know that in and of itself was such a brave. Um, thing uh, to do. Um, and women who, who stepped up to, um, to serve uh, in, uh, in the Union Army um, and fight for, um, for the, uh, the freedom of, um, of this country. One, a very interesting person to me um, is uh, Mary El Elizabeth Bowser. Um, she was a, um, in a Quaker family. Um, and so she wasn't a, a slave. The, the Quakers by that time had um, um, determined that slavery was uh, wrong. They didn't always believe that. Um, and her um, employer, uh, the Van Loos, um, they uh, sent her to school 
to um to learn to read and write and to become literate. And when she finished, uh, young Miss Van Lu had a spy network um, for the uh, a union spy network, and she recruited Mary for the spy network. And, they, and she placed her in the Confederate White House of Jefferson Davis. Wow. So Mary, um, in, with this racist man who had no respect for uh, that uh, a black woman could even come near uh, reading, um, Mary um, would be in the war, what essentially was the war room, reading, I mean, um, dusting and sweeping and reading and spying and getting wow. their secrets. Um, and passing them along to someone else that Miss Van Lu had placed uh, um, on uh, the route uh, as a baker. So she, Mary would pass along the secrets to the baker and then they get back to the Union Army. And what is important to me is that you have these two young women, one white, one black, who helped to win the, um, the Civil War for the Union, for the United States of America, and we know almost nothing about either one of them. Wow. Well, you know, before we move on to Barack, Cathay died at amputee, denied disability, was not able to get any benefits from the country she served right. and was injured by. And, uh, you know, sad story there. But Dr. Martin, as we move along, uh, this is a figure I think most people know that's in your museum. Was this one of the first wax uh, attributes to our first black uh, president of these United States? And who's that with him? Um, well, that's Congressman Elijah Cummings. And, um, and, and I want to wax figure there are a number of people who talked about you have got to get Congressman Elijah Cummings. Um, he was such a good friend of the museum. Um, he was the one, uh, Congressman Cummings, who um, introduced the legislation that made us the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. But um, we unveiled the um, figure of uh, President Barack Obama in 2009 on Jan, um, I think his uh, inauguration was the, the 20th or the 21st. There was something, uh, it's usually the 20th. So he was still in office. He, uh, he, was, um, he was just coming into office. This was his first yeah. inauguration. Um, he had not, he had just won in 2008. And we unveiled his figure the day before his inauguration. Wow. So, uh, we were, yeah, we were definitely um, uh, out there first. Um, and um, he promised um, Congressman Cummings that he was going to, uh, to come and see his wax figure. But, um, th I mean, if you can uh, remember, he was under such siege uh, when he came into um, into office, and um, just had uh, so many things. Um, so I'm I'm hoping that, uh, and when he comes, I'd like to think that that we're going to have Michelle uh, Obama as um, as well. Absolutely. Um, in yeah. And here is Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first black woman to become a physician. Went to the New England School of. Uh, 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 the New England Medical School, I believe, and she talks about, and you got to realize she was born in 1831, died in 1895. So being a African-American or Black woman physician in those times, Dr. Martin, what, what can you imagine? The What she had to go through to be a Black physician? Absolutely. And one of the things um, um, for uh, Black women getting into med medical school, which was um, just so difficult, um, and and um, and often when they when uh, the the few who got um, who got into medical school, they became they they were forced to become nurses or housekeepers, um, and and not to be able to practice uh, medicine. So uh, that in and of itself makes her um, so unique of that she got a medical um, degree that she didn't have to settle for um, wow. uh, 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 getting a nursing degree, which is uh, which is where. Um, that they attempted to um, push us. Dr. Martin, you there? So Christine um, yes, Jenkins. I, I, I didn't, did you ask me a question? Yeah, Christine <laughs> Jenkins, because I know the production, they're moving us along a bit and we want to cover a few of these. So I'm kind of, 
I'm kind of showing them as quickly as I possibly can, giving people enough to be inspired to go look at these people themselves. Now, we think that hair weave came from Asia, right? Hair weave didn't come from Asia. This is the lady that invented hair weave, right, Dr. Martin? Um, yes, and you know, um, all of the things that we have uh, done when it when it comes to um, hair, um, when uh, we look at the Poro uh, technique of Annie Malone, and um, and of course the the name that that people know, Madam C. J. Walker, and um, so much of what uh, what we know about hair, hair weaving, hair restoration started a. Uh, um, with um, black uh, women who had to, uh, the, they found themselves um, circumstances um, losing their hair, and and finding creative ways to overcome um, that. Wow! And, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so she invented the weave. Women had been wearing wigs for years, but she got a patent on the weave. A black woman. A yes. patent on the weave. So as you ladies go, wherever you go to get a weave, and, and, and why do I just say ladies? Because that's not necessarily true, right, Dr. Martin? Because guys get weaves. Who knows? Maybe I'll be there in a couple of years as I continue to thin out, but it's all in attribution to Christine M. Jenkins. And then we got this man. who, who This is a wider range because he's from... Ethiopia, right? Holly Selassie, Dr. Martin. He's in your museum yes. as a wax figure, right? Um, yes, he is. And he's been there from um, the, the time that we moved on to North Avenue in 1988. So a part of um, that that group of, um, of, of wax figures that would, uh, and a history that we thought it was important to tell. Um, and and uh, he tracing his roots back to um, Queen, um, Queen of Sheba. Um, and um, King Solomon, um, uh, and uh, to uh, Menelik uh, the second, um, the the child produced by Queen of Sheba and, and King Solomon, um, and um, the ways in which um, the, the the Rastafarians um, they um, they considered him consider him to be their spiritual uh, leader, and so that's the uh, he's. Um, his um, spiritual, his holy royal name, I'm sorry, royal name is Rastafari. And that's where our term Rastafarian comes from because um, he, um, they again, saw, see him as their spiritual leader. And this is Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler. And I may have gotten mixed up a bit. She is the first black woman to become a physician in the U.S., yes. right? That's right. Yes, and um, her counterpart, um, uh, Mary Mahoney, um, the first um, woman to become uh, um, a licensed uh, nurse, when nursing was considered to be a male profession, and uh, because you're dealing with the body, and and it was um, and for women to be nurses, I mean that's that was um, considered almost like prostitution. You were um, wow. a low. -life. Um, if you if you became a nurse, um, the same thing is true for secretaries. Um, secretaries were men, um, and so these are professions that women had to break into. And when you talk about the glass ceiling, you would uh, wouldn't think that um, being a um, um, a nurse or, or whatever would um, in today's world be considered break, breaking the glass ceiling, but it it was. And then we've got Kenya. First president, Jomo Kenyatta, right? And his claim to fame is that he fought the openly European countries and the colonization and the pillage of Africa, our motherland, the continent of Africa. He fought openly that. Can you tell us a little bit more about him, uh, Dr. Martin, because he's also in your wax museum, correct? Correct, and um, the, the the logic for um, him, um, uh, along with um, uh, Kwame and Kruma and, and and some of the others that we have um, in our um, museum, Elmer was um, a, around working around the museum, and he heard, there was a group of um, there was a teacher with her kids in the um, uh, you know 
touring the museum and the um, kids asked, um, has, has there ever been a black president? And she said, well, no, um, um, there hasn't, but that's going to change one day because this was pre uh, Barack Obama. Um, and Elma said he walked up and, and, and pulled her aside and he said, um, the next time, uh, what I suggest is that um, you answered the question correctly, but um, you can also say that even though we haven't, uh, that there hasn't been a president that we that we know of uh, of, the, of the United States, uh, we've been leaders all over this um, um, this world, uh, of the, and particularly in Africa, uh, we fought uh, leaders who fought for the independence of their countries and and emerged as um, the leaders of those countries. And, and so that's why we ended up doing that exhibit because he wanted to send that message that we've been leaders uh, of, um, of African nations. And, um, and here's that, another that, one, here's another one, Dr. Martin, as we push through this. This is Marcus, who is this? Is this Marcus Garvey? That's Marcus Garvey, yes. Um, the United and the significance United. of Marcus Garvey because we hear his name synonymous with protests, setting up unions, What's the significance and why did you feel as though this historian deserved to be in your wax museum? Uh, well, Marcus Garvey um, was a man who fought for um, uh, Negro improvement, um, the ways in which we need to come together and build institutions in our, um, in our country. He um, was a part of the Back to um, Africa um, movement where you come and you, and you gain um, strength and um, and so forth here in America, but you always give back to and, and go back to Africa to um, to help it um, overcome some of the challenges that colonialism and racism have um, wrought upon um, your mother uh, country. And Dr. Shirley Jackson, you um. I, is she the one that um, for, uh, concerning energy and um, uh, let me tell you about this young lady, Dr. Martin, to me, and she's still alive. All of you that have phones out there, call oh. waiting, call waiting, invented by a black woman. OK, so she's an inventor. She did what dealt with fiber optics. But this is a name that we should Google. This is what it is that our kids in school should understand and know that the simplistic, the, we take phones for granted, but don't understand the significance that we have had on that technology that is almost a permanent part of our hands now. But Dr. Shirley Jackson, who was the inventor of touch tone phones, solar cells, fiber optic cable, fiber optic cables that allow sound or noise, I guess, to go through lines and call waiting as well. So your ability to have Dr. Martin on hold as you talk to someone else is a result of Dr. Shirley Jackson, Dr. Martin. Wonderful, wonderful inventor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes. Dr. Martin, I think that we have gotten to a point where you know, we're pressed for a bit of time. See, we needed two hours for you. And the viewership, Dr. Martin, is off the charts. You're watching 60 Minutes in Black America. We got Dr. Joanne Martin here as we talk Black history and theory. And we talk a bit about politics. Dr. Martin has been absolutely fantastic having you on. We're pressed because we got crypto, our crypto consultant coming on behind you. But I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk to the viewers about the museum and anything else you want, if you can, if you, if, if two minutes is good enough for you, you got it, Dr. Martin. You got the last say on this. Well, um, I consider it to um, be a blessing uh, to uh, have been in, invited by Dr. Elmer Martin to come on this journey uh, with him. It's uh, been one of the most meaningful things uh, that could happen to me in my life. Um, and I uh, am most of all appreciative of that, of what we get to do with, uh, with our youth. Um, a program that I'm very proud of is training them to be um, tour guides and training them to do a motor coach uh, tour, training them to get to know the tourism industry because it's a, mo a multi-billion dollar industry and I want them to know it 
from the supply side, not um, just from the um, service uh, side, but to be the entrepreneurs, be the business owners uh, and so forth. And, um, and so getting to um, know that um, I can help shape um, some minds um, and, and all of the ways that I have been blessed uh, to be a part of this journey that is the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. Truly grateful. Dr. Martin, the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum, Google it, go to the website, figure out wherever part of the country are, if you are, how you can get, we know the Southwest gets you there, right? Southwest for most places get you there. And when you come into the airport, you'll be greeted as I was by some lifelike uh, wax figures attributed to us as a people. Dr. Martin, thank you so much. I know this is a busy month. You're going to be in the state of Florida as well this month, right? Aren't you going to be in Florida educating the people and some students? Yeah. Yes, in uh, Panama City and um, Lynn Haven and Uli, Uli, Florida. Hey, listen, I want you to be surrounded by your Florida people. You got Remy, you got Jasmine. I pulled them in. They didn't like it. This is an entire <laughs> Florida screen. It's all about Florida tonight, right? And so you Floridians are important in 60 Minutes of Black America. We love you guys for what you've done. Now let's get Jamie on uh, uh, so we can talk some crypto. Dr. Martin, I'll be in touch. Great show as usual, Dr. Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Hey, Martin. Hey, you're watching 60 Minutes in Black America. We're going to go a little over because we want to make sure that we educate to the financial aspect of what we need to do in our community. So Jamie Miner, who is our cryptocurrency expert and who we enlisted to help support our young people, the three that you saw up on the screen, Remy, Jasmine, Jeremiah, and lead their expertise in understanding financial investment. We said a few months, a few weeks ago, crypto, when it was highlighted as an opportunity because it was crashing, right. was an opportunity for us to get involved in. So here we go, Jamie. Jamie, what's happening, buddy? What's happening in the crypto world? And is it still a good opportunity for us to invest in? Yeah, things are great. And, um, you know, since it's been about six weeks, I think, since we started the portfolio with the, with the group, um, you know, the one of the things about Dr. Martin I really got that hit me as we were talking backstage and, and even on your show is just making, um, honoring people that try to make an impact. So, you know, what we've been doing is just trying to make a financial impact and going over things researching, learning, um, and uh, a portfolio right now. Um, I, I've, if, they, if it's possible to put up on the screen, I can show you some results of how the, some of the guys have been doing. And I think Jasmine has some results. There we go, some results. Now we started off with what? They started off with $100 about five, six weeks ago? Yeah, about six weeks ago. So we're up about 30% on the overall portfolio and of, of what we put together. You know, something that kind of gave a, 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 a balance of risk base, let's say, okay? And then if you look at this next one that I, I, I provided for them, I'm going to show you one particular coin inside of there. This is Gala Games. Now, this is a crypto coin. It's in the gaming sector. So what they think is that, you know, um, gaming is a, is a very popular um, gateway to get people excited. So explain about gaming to people. Is that like craps and slaps <laughs> or, you know... This is is it gaming in terms of playing with the, 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 the sticks and all that? Yeah, stuff? yeah. Like we used to have Nintendo back in the day, Mike. This is like, you know, this is like <laughs> way, this is like way forward, like really nice graphic games and games you can participate in and you can, you can actually make money within the games. So there's a financial benefit to actually playing the games. Um, this particular game games that I recommend is up 141% since we, uh, did that six weeks ago. So if you just put, you know, a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars in this, right now a thousand would be, you know, fourteen hundred dollars. You'd have your money in back and then some already to flip around. So um so this is the importance of having Jamie as our coach, financial coach. We had Teddy the <clears throat> tax man last week talked about getting a life insurance policy to create some generational wealth in addition to dealing with real estate, also saving some money. 
Jamie's talking about Bitcoin. He's talking about crypto in the down market. Here's an opportunity for us to take advantage of. Now you're learning that investing in gaming would have gotten you a return on your investment sooner than later because we're in the know, because we're having these conversations, Jamie. Jamie, what's happening with Bitcoin? Bitcoin's doing good. There's another chart we can pull up right next here. We can kind of get an idea. This sit right here is um it's having a little bit of a dip right now but it's it's been a, it's been on a massive run the last month has gained about 40 percent but if, if you can look at this graph now this is what i want people to get an idea and this is one of the things we teach inside of the, the mentorship okay this is like risk reward you know if i put up a dollar uh what's my potential loss and what's my potential gain this is the overall market that uh, with that graph and it shows basically in the red there that small amount is the risk and that green large amount is the reward if this just goes back to where the market was before the risk reward right now is about six times your your money so every dollar you put in the potential is to gain at least uh six times your money and so what we try to teach is not to take any trades any investments that don't give you at least a three to one risk to reward ratio so that's like a small tip right there of how to uh, wait, uh, look, evaluate your money so you can decide, you know, I have a dollar here. I'd like to turn it uh, at least 33 times my, my investment or else I'm not going to take it because a 50-50 type of re reward ratio, you might lose your money and, and it's not worth the, risking that amount of money to win just the same amount, you know, like a one-to-one -one basis. So we teach simple concepts like that, risk to reward. Let's see what's the potential of it could be. How much am I going to risk and then decide whether or not we want to get in that investment or not? So stuff like that. Well, that's powerful, Jamie. And when you get a 30 percent return on your investment for our young people in a month, just better than a month, that's profound. When you start talking about three times your investment, looking at the adverse risk yes. analysis that you provide people. This is you guys should be climbing on this show for this information, because this is what we lack as a community community, the ability to exploit and to learn and to have someone like Jamie educate us to stuff that may not always be sexy and interesting. It's true. Okay, But to take the time to put up Jamie's Twitter, because that's how he likes to communicate, <laughs> say, hey, Jamie, I got $200. Instead of giving my grandkid a Nintendo, can I put it into this portfolio that you've created with these young people and let me have him sit it there for 10 years. Well, this think is about what it, Mike. About you guys. One of those... Wake up, people. Wake up to what Teddy the Tax Man, Jamie Miner is talking about. We're talking about financial independence and creating generational wealth with information that isn't always the sexiest and most appealing, but information that we need to continue to hammer away in our community. Jamie, I know you're going to be back next week. Give us a little bit more. And in addition, I know that in three weeks, you're going to have your own hour with other experts in the financial world because we're going to hook you up. And we ask our people to remember that this is as important as any education and any history for Black people. Jamie, thanks a lot for being here. Our crypto coach, crypto expert, Jamie Miner. 60 Minutes in Black America. We'll be back next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Super Bowl Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. You give me the day off. Leon Thomas will be your host next week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great week.